Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to feast upon your word together. I just ask that you would filter out all of that which is foolishness, but seal to our hearts that which is truth, the truth you'd have us know. We give you all the, the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the first epistle to the Corinthians, verse by verse. We've reached chapter 16, and I'm going to try to finish that up in the next couple of videos. I will in this video, uh, probably the latter part of it, I will talk a little bit about a subject that was brought up to me by one of our viewers uh, that uh, I, I've asked for prayer concerning the direction of this ministry and one of the requests was that I do something on the subject of parables, Jesus' parables. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that, maybe sort of get us, uh, get the wheels turning a little bit uh, concerning that subject uh, as we proceed to finish, uh, close out this marvelous epistle, uh, 1 Corinthians. We've still got a ways to go, chapter 16. Now, concerning the collection, that's verse 1 uh, for the saints. That word there is, is contribution. As I've given order to the churches of, of Galatia, even so do ye. Uh, most commentators agree that uh, that Paul had given these instructions to all the churches uh, concerning the uh, the collection of the saints, so the, the very nature the uh, uh, of uh, the I guess my, what you might say the uh, the nature, the function, the characteristics, and the evidence for for offerings, uh, collections, uh, helping the needy. Uh, and he says in verse 2, upon the first day of the week, and I'm going to take that to be Sunday. You know, I, I lived probably half my life before uh, someone brought it to my attention that Sunday was the first day of the week. I think it was when I was a little boy, I used to, to kind of look at school as starting on Monday. So to me, that was the first day of the week. And I had no idea that Sunday was the first day of the week. Now, most people think that Sunday is probably the Sabbath. It's not. It's uh, the first day of the week. Uh, the Sabbath is Saturday. It, goes, it runs from Friday sunset to Saturday sunset on the Hebrew calendar. Uh, the early church's uh, Sunday uh, meeting uh, is patterned after the Lord's resurrection on the first day of the week. Saturday's the Sabbath, the Jewish Sabbath, gave way to an, to an early church, uh, the, the beginning of the church, an infant church, uh, that from its beginning gathered together on, on a Sunday for worship. Let The text says, let every one of you and lay by him in store as God has prospered him. Every one of you, the grammar the words in the text, as well as the grammar, makes it absolutely clear that he's speaking about everyone, uh, regardless of age, gender, uh, occupation, uh, everyone. Let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him. Where does it say 10%? Well, it doesn't. And of course, it doesn't for good reason. Because there's been a change of covenants, we've you know from the old covenant to the new covenant, uh, from law to grace, and, and under grace, it has nothing to do with any percentage. And he says this that there be no gatherings when I come. I take that to mean that there's more important matters to do. That you know when I come, it wouldn't make any sense for me to come, and and we'd be involved in all this gathering to, of, of these collections when uh, there's much more important things to do, and I think that that has to do with doctrine. 
uh, teaching. And when I come, verse 3, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters. Well, we can see a, there's a matter of trust being built up here uh, or being displayed, a, sub, a concern for, for trust being displayed. Them will I send to bring your liberality, the word the King James says liberality, the word is grace, charis, your grace unto Jerusalem. Unto Jerusalem. And, and if it be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. There were a lot of needy saints in Jerusalem. Uh, if you read most commentaries, most articles, things on the subject, uh, you'll discover that uh, there were many poor saints at the beginning of, of, of this new thing called the church in Jerusalem. And they were having a hard time, especially when it came to opposition, uh, because of simply because of the fact this was Jerusalem. And and so we can see God's concern. This is I remind you, this is God's word. It's Paul's uh, writing it. He's writing it, but God authored this. We're we're looking at the the word of God here. I've stressed that more more often than people would uh, I think probably uh, uh, would uh, would think is necessary I think it's it's so necessary to to do that because when we go to the commentaries and we look at articles and we read stuff written on on any of this what we're looking at is is the Paul's thoughts Paul's reasoning Paul's logic and so on and so forth this is the Word of God uh, God has a concern for His people. He had a concern for, for these saints at Jerusalem, and it is uh, absolutely 100%, completely by grace, as far as the, the soul, entire subject of collections is concerned. It's not how much you give. It's not how often you give. It's not uh, in, in what manner you give. Uh, although, this is a church context. We, we're looking at a church context here. And I think it's important to keep that in mind. We, we haven't left 1 Corinthians. This is a, the church at Corinth. So the, the context is, is the church. And if it be meet, verse 4, that I go also, they shall go with me. So we see in that verse... Uh, that uh, Paul was uh, uh, very much interested in returning. Now in verse 5, you know, we, we can read a lot about the missionary journeys of Paul and, and where he went and, and, and how he went and, and why he went and, and everything else. Uh, let me read verse 5. Now, I'll, I will come unto you when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia, uh, it was apparently it was uh, uh, Macedonia was was on its way to Corinth, and it may be that I will abide. It may be that I'll remain. That's a subjunctive there in the in the in the grammar. It's it's the mood of uncertainty. Maybe he will. Maybe he won't remain or abide uh, and winter with them. Uh, in order that, that they would help him on his uh, on his journey wherever the Lord sent him is what the text is saying. For I will not see you now by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you if the Lord permit. You know, we know that we're to say in our lives, you know, we, we shall do this or that if the Lord's willing, if the Lord wills, uh, you know, it's, it's God's will, not our will. Uh, it's uh, I think it ought to be uh, just as as comfortable as breathing to say in our walk and, and in our life and in our relationship with the Lord that if the Lord wills we'll do this or that to do contrary to do otherwise is, is obviously uh, a self-willed 
mindset. And of course, that's, that's a pretty simple, basic truth that I think most people can understand. However, it's, it's really hard to get into the, to the habit of that. But I don't think that it's that big of a, of a, of a trial or an obstacle of, you know, to get into the habit of saying, well, if the Lord wills, I'll do this or that, providing we understand that God's sovereign will is for our best. That is probably not something that is uh, universally accepted. You know, that everything that happens in our lives is for our best. But if we truly believe that, then I don't, I don't see where we have any problem saying that if, if the Lord wills, we'll do this or that. If I go, if I stay, uh, doesn't matter. And I think that there, we could draw a wide application to that. You know, even, even to, you know, when it comes to our still being here waiting on the Lord's return. You know, we'll be here if the Lord wills, we'll be here. If the Lord doesn't, will, we'll be taken, we'll be raptured. It's, it's not a complicated truth to understand, but it does tend to, to run in, into a conflict, you know, because we have that old man, that old sin nature that, that I mean, the self just thrives on, on having its own way. I will not see you now, by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you if the Lord permit. You can clearly see Paul's desire to be with his people, but don't, don't miss the, the fact that this is God's word and God desires to be with us. You know, when you read that, you know, but I, for I will not see you now, by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you if the Lord permit. I mean, it's easy just to, to look at that as just, well, that's just Paul. But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great door and effectual is opened unto me. I'm, I'm sure it was at, at Ephesus. Uh, uh, and on Pentecost and there are so many adversaries so many adversaries that is a verse what is that? I believe it's verse 6 uh, I, I want to look at the Greek on this word this uh, 1 Corinthians 16 oppose me is what the uh, Berean Study Bible says. It's uh, verse 9. If I, if I go to the interlinear and I look at this word, a door to me has opened. It has opened. Uh, great. Great doors opened. And productive, as it says the Greek. And many are opposing. That word opposing there in the Greek, that, that verb is, is antik, an, mahi. Funny sounding word, a lot of Greek words are. It's, it means to lie opposite, to oppose, to withstand, just to lie opposite to, anti. You know, it's against, it's fully against, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's like someone being thoroughly unreconcilable, okay? And, of course, we know that truth, uh, well, we just know that, that, that I mean, what fellowship has light with darkness? There, there is no compatibility. There is no compromise. You know, the, all we have is the truth of the Word of God. We live in a world that is just full of lies, and yet we, we know. We don't just have the truth of the Word of God. We know the, uh, the God who is himself truth Jesus Christ the the truth the way the truth and the life verse 9 verse 10 now if Timothy uh, Timotheus in the King James come see that he may be with you without fear without fear if you read most of the commentaries, what you'll find out is that uh, they're most most of them are in agreement with the fact that 
that Paul was sort of looked at as this guy that didn't have, he wasn't very eloquent, you know, as far as his speech was, was concerned, maybe even his looks, uh, maybe the way he walked, talked, who knows. But he wasn't, uh, he wasn't exactly the poster, you know, boy for, you know, uh, uh, you know, he wasn't, uh, I, I don't know what, what ex ex expression to use here. He just, I don't think that he, by in, in his appearance and in his speech, he was, he was all of that exciting a person to be around. Uh, and many, many of those uh, uh, who knew Paul and knew Timothy and knew Apollos and everything, they, they knew that, uh, that most of the commentators are in agreement with the fact that there, was, there were many there at Corinth who kind of looked at Timothy as, well, he's just a young kid. He doesn't know a whole lot. Uh, you know, he's nothing compared to Paul. And of course, if you try to put yourself in Timothy's place, if you were Timothy, how would you feel, you know, taking a stepping up in, into the place of Paul and doing this because he, Timothy was doing the same work of, that Paul was doing. And, and it's interesting, this, this contrast that we're going to see here because we're going to look at Apollos. And in Apollos, it's, uh, it's a different story with Apollos. Apollos was a very, uh, he was just, we're looking at the opposite now. I mean, we're looking at someone who was quite eloquent, uh, quite presentable, quite uh, admirable, okay? Who's placed in contrast with Paul. And what I gained from the text is, and this is maybe just a little bit uh, difficult for me to to try to explain, is that we're looking at, first First, we're looking at Timothy, who's not quite, there's, there's people that don't want Timothy there, they'd rather have Paul, they don't want Timothy, uh, or, or they're, they're, there's a fear, at least a, a fear on, uh, on the part of Paul that, that they won't treat Timothy fairly, that, he, that he'll, He'll be with them in fear, and and that because he's not Paul. And then and then we're looking at Apollos, who is. Uh, there were people that were really pushing for Paul. They they wanted even Paul wanted Apollos to to be there. There's no record of him ever coming to Corinth, uh, at least not that I found. But there were people that really wanted him there, and. Uh, According to the historical record, Apollos really didn't want to be there because he didn't want to play party to their, to their, uh, I guess what you'd call a, uh, he didn't want to be a part of that, of that whole idea of, well, okay, you know, uh, you, you wanted me here because I am a better speaker than Paul. And so I, I, I hope, I, and, I, and I probably haven't explained this very well, but I hope you, you see that in the contrast there, you're, the, the two are being brought up as examples of, of what uh, the Corinthians should not have been involved in, which we, we found out early in the, in the study that they were fleshly, that they were carnal, that they, they weren't understanding things the way that they should. Uh, let no man despise Timothy but conduct him forth in peace that he may come unto me for I'll look for him with the brethren. They were very close, Paul and Timothy. Verse 12 is touching our brother Apollos. I greatly desired him to come unto you with the brethren, which is what they wanted, the Corinthians wanted to as well. But his will was not at all to come at this time. I, I suggested what I think was his reason for not coming, uh, but he will come when he shall have convenient time. That's not a subjunctive. I looked at that. I thought, well, is, is that saying, but he will come, maybe, well, he may come, may come, maybe he will, maybe he won't. No, it's a definite, he will come when he shall have convenient time. Yet I've found no historical record where he came. But I don't think that the subjunctive needs to be there. It is an indicative mood. 
He will definitely, indicative mood, he will come when he shall have convenient time. God could say that without him ever actually coming. Verse 13, watch ye stand fast in the faith. Stand fast in the faith. That's not your faith. That's not your faith in God. You don't stand fast in something that will constantly fail. Those, those, those of you out there who are of a different mind that, uh, that, you know, that, and I, I, I mean, I could launch off into an entirely, uh, just a, a whole complete sermon on, on the matter of faith. And it's not in how that it's the faithfulness of Christ in our lives that we live by, that we walk by, that we don't, we don't live according to our own faith. We don't walk according to our own faith. We don't rely in or trust in our own faith. We don't have faith in our faith, okay? We don't have faith in our own faith. We do have faith in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. We have absolute trust, absolute confidence in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. I don't have any faith in my faith in Christ. None. Now, I know I do have faith in Christ. But I don't stand in that. Watch ye. Now, that's a watch term. Everybody that's looking for the rapture loves that word watch. It includes eschatological, end times, prophetic things. But it's not just limited to that concept or that, or that reality there. We, there's a lot of things to watch for, folks. We, we watch for, for wolves in sheep's clothing. You know? we, we, uh, we watch... Uh, our, our, uh, our, how we walk, you know, we were to walk worthy of the calling wherein we were called. We are, there's a lot of things that we can do as believers in Christ under grace, uh, to watch ourselves, you know, to watch, look, uh, it's not as much an inward inspection of ourselves as it is an outward assessment of what's going on in every aspect of our lives and, and how God's working in our lives. Watch ye stand fast in the faith. We stand in that faith. Quit you. Uh, or just, let me just say, act like men. Act like men. Be strong. Be strong. You know, I, well, but now wait a minute. I thought it was when we were weak we were strong. Well, well, that's true. Uh, but we have no strength. We're not adequate in and of ourselves as anything coming from ourselves. Our adequacy is of God. Uh, we, the, the strong, if, if you want to be careful not to, to take and relate that word strong to the flesh. The flesh is not only weak. The flesh profits nothing. Verse 14, let all your things be done with charity. That's with love. Verse 15, I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Archaea, of Achaia, and that they have addicted, that word there means assigned, themselves to the ministry of the saints. You assign yourself to the ministry of the saints. That you submit yourselves unto such and to everyone that helps with us in labors. I'm glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus for that which was lacking on your part. They have supplied. God will supply. If you think that God's depending on you to, to supply someone's need, well, I got news for you. Uh, whether you do or you don't, that need's going to be supplied somehow. For they have refreshed my spirit and yours, therefore acknowledge ye them that are such. Refreshed my spirit and yours. I think that's what we constantly do a lot on here on YouTube, on Facebook, and at church, and in real life, on the street, uh, off the street, 
the only thing that would refresh our spirit would be the grace, the, the, the grace and truth that came through Jesus Christ. Law won't do that. All the brethren greet you, greet you one another with a holy handshake. I'm going to say here in Oklahoma, I, you know, I call it a cultural thing. It's sort of, you know, our fist bump, holy fist bump, holy handshake, holy kiss. We're looking at an actual historical context here. Uh, Middle East custom, you know, kissing, you know, it's not exactly something that we typically love to do here in Oklahoma, but. You know, uh, uh, I'll shake any one of your, your hands anytime. 21, the salutation of me, Paul, with my own hand. Now Paul is actually writing this with his own hand. Verse 22, a verse that people have pondered over for millennia. If any man love, that is uh, the word, there is not agape, it's phileo, it's affection, brotherly love. If you don't have any affection at all for Jesus Christ, if anyone does not have any affection at all for Jesus Christ, let him remain. Let him be. Let him be. Let him exist. The word is not continue, remain. It's just be. The word is exist in a state of uh, condemnation. Maranatha. Maranatha, you know, depending on how you say it, there depends. There's different various variations of that. They, some people think that that means the Lord has come. Some people will think that that means the Lord has, uh, will come. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Last verse in the Bible. Some think it means to, the Lord has come. But strictly speaking, literally, the word literally means the Lord has come. It's because He has come that, that they are to uh, let Him be anathema and that makes all the sense in the world to me there is no way that you're going to, and we're going to see this once we get into the parables uh, some discussion concerning parables that there's no way that you can uh, browbeat someone into heaven uh, the lord has come in other words and i hardly know how to put this into words Uh, just that one statement, the Lord has come, is basically saying to me that that's, that's God saying to me that this person that does not love the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be dealt with in a just manner because the Lord has come. Now, I probably didn't say that very well, but that's, that's the feeling that I get from that, that verse. And then we reach verse 23, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Love and grace. Love and grace. And the two things that we are constantly, constantly challenged with in our lives is, in my opinion, are those two things. It's easy to feel sometimes the Lord doesn't love you because of what He's taking you through, what He's dragging you through. It's very easy to think sometimes that, that His grace, it's, it's law, not grace, that governs in our lives and our walk and our relationship with Him. This is God the Holy Spirit. God the author of this epistle, this marvelous epistle who's telling us this. And we've seen grace and love throughout the entire epistle. We've seen it from the very beginning. It opened up with it. It closes with it. And that's how I'm going to close 1 Corinthians, the epistle to you all. It's been a great time. I've, I've enjoyed every bit of it. I've learned a whole lot. I hope you have too. And so I'm going to spend a little, little bit of time just sort of uh, maybe uh, giving somewhat of a, a little bit of an introduction on, on the subject of parables that someone was interested in. It's a very dear sister of ours in Christ that uh, uh, messaged me and, and asked me to do this. I told her that I would think about that, pray about it. Uh, and I think that that would be a wonderful thing to do uh, given the fact that we're in between uh, verse by verse uh, uh, on 
studies on our playlist. A parable, folks, is literally, just simply put, is just something that's, uh, it's, it's, if, if, if you cast something alongside something else. I put this, I put my Bible and I put the water beside it, okay? I, it's, I put the two together. Uh, Jesus' parables were, were stories that were cast alongside a truth in order to illustrate that truth. They were teaching aids, is what they were. You know, think of it like a, like an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Jesus' parables were simple stories that imparted a spiritual lesson. Just think comparison, okay? Uh, you know, there are parables in the Bible other than those found in the Gospels. The book of, of Proverbs is, is full of analogies. You know, whenever Solomon used a, a comparison to teach a truth, especially uh, in... Uh, well, let me just say that any time Solomon used a comparison to teach a truth, it was, it was a, the result was it just... A, it was a simple parable. And I, let me give you an example, one example here. And that's Proverbs 20, verse 2. Proverbs 20, verse 2 says, A king's wrath strikes terror like the roar of a lion. The roaring of a lion is, is, is cast alongside the wrath of a king for the purpose of comparison. And, and comparison is really the essence of, of parabolic language. For a time in, in our Lord's ministry, he, he relied heavily on parables. He told a lot of them. He told a whole lot of them. Uh, no one's exactly uh, quite sure how many parables there are, I don't think, in the entire Bible. I think they've, they've, they've pretty much narrowed down how many Jesus said uh, or Jesus used. Uh, there are parables other than those that, that Jesus used. But he told a lot of them. And, but according to Mark, when we look at the Gospel of Mark, we, we, we learn that he didn't say anything to his disciples without using a parable. That's a direct quote from Scripture that ought to really, we ought to really find that surprising. It's hard to speak uh, it, I, I, don't know, I guess maybe I'm reading between the in the white spaces here. I'm sure the Lord had other things to say to the disciples that He didn't say in, in parables that were that didn't have anything to do with doctrinal truth. But any time He spoke to them, uh, was teaching them, He used a parable. He didn't say anything to them without using a parable. That is Mark chapter four, verse thirty-four. And there's about 35 of Jesus' parables in the Synoptic Gospels. But now, it hadn't always been that way. It wasn't always that way. In the early part of His ministry, our Lord's ministry, uh, He didn't use parables. And then suddenly, He begins using, He, be, he begins telling parables exclusively. Uh, much to the surprise of his disciples. His disciples were actually surprised by it. And they asked him, they said, why do you speak to the people in parables? Uh, we know that from Matthew chapter 13. And, yeah, Matthew 13. And Jesus explained to his disciples that they had a twofold purpose that they were to reveal the truth to those who wanted to know it, and to, they, it was to conceal the truth from those who were indifferent. Uh, in Matthew 12, the Pharisees had, uh, uh, just the, the chapter right before that, the Pharisees had publicly rejected their Messiah and blasphemed the Holy Spirit. 
they, they fulfilled Isaiah's prophecy of a, of a, of a hard-hearted, spiritually blind people that, that Isaiah spoke of. And his response was to begin teaching in parables. That's the why or how that came about, I believe you could say that. And many others like the Pharisees, that, that wasn't just the Pharisees, they would, they would dis, just dismiss his parables as just utter nonsense, uh, irrelevant nonsense. This before the church began at Pentecost when they would receive the Holy Spirit. No one at that time was indwelt by the Holy Spirit. This was not to happen until Pentecost. That's an important note, to, a fact to remember in all this. And uh, Jesus made sure his disciples understood the meaning of the parables. Uh, he, he really made sure that they understood when he was alone with them, he explained everything. That's Mark chapter 4. You know, when we go to interpret one of these, and I'm going to try to do some of those in the next couple of videos, uh, it can present a few challenges for the, for the student of Scripture. Sometimes uh, interpretation, the interpretation is easy. Uh, and it's, it's easy because the Lord Himself gave, gives the interpretation in the parable. You know, like the parable of the sower, the parable of the wheat and the tares, the, both of those are explained in, in Matthew 13. But it's not always the case. And, the, and so there are some uh, procedures. Uh, uh, we can, or I don't know how we, or some methods, some principles that can help that can help uh, us interpret these parables correctly. The first thing I would ask, I would ask that you ask, is that is who is he speaking to? Who is it talking to? You know, most of you don't understand I'm a dispensationalist. You know, I distinguish, I, I rightly divide between dispensations. The, you know, we're looking at a time before the church. Here, we're looking at a time after the church began, it does make a difference. Believe me, it makes a difference. Who's he speaking to? Uh, context, I've talked a lot about context. Context is invaluable. You've got to, to pay attention to, to give heed, take note of context. Any parable will be preceded by some verses that provide a context. You know, for example, uh, Jesus uh, often, he, he preceded uh, a parable with the words, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. Uh, uh, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, we, we, read, we read, this is what we read. We read that uh, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus uh, told this parable, Luke 18, 9. Self-righteousness, spiritual pride. So context is important. Who's he speaking to? That's important. Uh, comparing Scripture with Scripture is important. Whatever... Um, interpretation that we come up with has to be consistent with the whole. It has to be consistent with all the rest. That, that's a basic principle of hermeneutics. It's, it's vital to anyone who's studying the Scriptures. Uh, Jesus' parables will never contradict the rest of the Word of God which, which He came to, to express. These, the parables are meant to illustrate doctrine. And, and the, the teachings Jesus illuminated, they're, they're, they are clearly taught elsewhere. If you look at a parable, you can find that same truth being taught elsewhere in Scripture. You know, the most, one of the most interesting aspects of all this is that, that His people hear His voice. We know from our, you know, looking at John, just the book of John, that listening to our Lord's own words, His people hear His voice. 
After telling some of his parables, Jesus said, Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Uh, in John, we hear, that's in Mark. And in John, we hear him say, The reason you can't hear me is because you're not my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. God says that his people will hear. And that remains true of all time. I mean, you know, before the time of Christ, uh, his people heard. You know, when Christ was here, his people heard. And, and now, the present time, his people will hear. In the future, when we're gone, his people will hear. That's, that's just the truth of it. But you got to understand that, that, that he spoke in parables because the people did not see, hear, or understand. There was no indwelling of the Holy Spirit at that time. We don't need parables now. We have the Word of God. And we have the Holy Spirit, who's our teacher. Uh, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there are 39 parables that are, that are that I, now don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying we take all Jesus' parables here and just throw them out the, the window. The, I don't have a window to throw it out of, but it's, we don't, that's not what I'm saying. Uh, in Matthew, Mark, uh, Luke and John, there's about 39, they say, parables uh, that are spread throughout the King James Version. And many of those are repeated throughout these four books. Uh, the majority of them is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, not so many in John. Some of the major ones uh, you're familiar with, there's the sower, the mustard seed, the leaven, the hidden treasure, the pearl of priceless value, the growing seed, the unforgiving servant, the two debtors, the good Samaritan, the lost sheep, the lost going, the lost son, that's the prodigal son. Uh, that's a lot of ground to cover if I was going to do a, a series on this. I'll, I'll pray about that and we'll see how the Lord leads. But uh, I find it interesting that the first parable was is the lost sheep. First parable. Sort of, it, to me, kind of reveals the heart of our Lord toward His people, you know, I think. You know, there's other themes uh, in these epistle, in these uh, uh, parables. Uh, the kingdom of God is one. Uh, the kingdom of heaven, those are two distinct terms. The kingdom of God encompasses all those saved throughout all dispensations. Kingdom of God. If you, now I'm just going to be put it as simply as I can. That phrase, kingdom of heaven, refers to the, to the literal thousand-year reign of Christ on earth. It's literally in the text it reads, the grammar says King of the heaven, a kingdom of the heavens, plural. But it's, it's, a, it's a term that's used, it refers to that thousand year period of Christ. And beyond, perhaps, some would suggest even beyond that. But the kingdom of God is, is though, are those that are redeemed throughout all, all ages. That's the kingdom of God. All of the redeemed, all ages. So you'll see parables that deal with the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven or literally the kingdom of the heavens. And you'll see uh, parables that talk about hearing, about uh, seeking, about growing, uh, about redemption, about loss. Uh, you know, uh, the opposite of redemption. Uh, about love, about forgiveness, about prayer and about things to come, eschatology, biblical prophecy, things future. And so that's a lot of ground to cover, and it's a very interesting uh, subject to get into, a topic to get into. I don't know how many of you would be interested in that. I will try to, to do some, some on this. I don't know if, if it's something I want to just fully, you know, just sort of headlong dive, full, just take the full plunge into, but uh, I do... Uh, I do believe that uh, that uh, I would, uh, I just, you know, when someone asks me to do something like this, uh, I, I, I take it very, I consider it very prayerfully. And so, because it could just could be, you know, it's easy for me to just say, well, this is what I want to do. After we get, now we're done with 1 Corinthians now. That's it. All right. Now, it's, now let's see, where would I like to go? Well, Genesis, I, you know, I mean, I don't know. Revelation, I, don't know, I already did that. 
Folks, it's not about what this ministry wants. It's, it's about what we, as God's people, I have to include myself, need. And, uh, and I think we're all involved in that. I, th I think it's a wonderful thing that He takes and uses us all. Uh, that we labor together in the Word together. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Uh, until next time, rest in Him. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.